um, it'll be great to also take a look at some of the data that comes out of the acute uh, CV care meeting in 2022 as well when the time comes around. So what I'd like to highlight today in the course of this brief talk is seven key studies. Uh, two of them focused on the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy and acute coronary syndromes, two of them on the use of implantable monitors to, to direct, detect arrhythmias in high-risk patients, two of them focused on the prevention and treatment of viral respiratory illnesses, and then finally one which I'll spend a little bit more time on uh, concerning the allocation of coronary angiography uh, in patients who survive cardiac arrest. Now, Clearly, there were many outstanding trials that were presented uh, at ESC, and if for no other reason than limitations of time, we can't touch on them all. Um, I will mention one other one, uh, which I think was a real explosive study from the meeting that's going to touch on many of us in other forums, uh, namely the Emperor Preserved study. So this was a study of the SGLT2 inhibitor empaphylagliglosin in heart failure in patients who have a preserved left ventricular ejection fraction. And I won't get into the details, only to mention that over several decades now, medical therapy for heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction has really been an elusive disease process to treat with many frustrations in randomized studies of medical therapies. And so this was remarkable and really meriting a much longer dissection than we can afford it today, uh, in so much as that it showed a significant reduction uh, in the primary composite endpoint. Um, of cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure with use of the SGLT2 inhibitor versus placebo. Uh, so a very exciting study, one which was uh, consistent with what was seen uh, with use of such agents in reduced ejection fraction heart failure uh, and really creates this drug class as one of the important ones that we need to think about uh, in treating our patients with heart failure and a preserved ejection fraction. Um, so with that noted, I'm going to dive into the seven studies that I want to focus on for today in the context of this critical care meeting. So a first question that I think was touched on in important ways at this meeting was, how do we weigh the ischemic and bleeding risks uh, of patients who are undergoing PCI, in particular for acute coronary syndromes? And can we get away with using a shorter duration of dual antiplatelet therapy? So as we all know in this meeting, really standard care for those undergoing percutaneous coronary intervention is the combination of aspirin with a second inhibitor of the platelet adenosine diphosphate receptor or P2Y12 uh, receptor. And yet over the recent years, moving away from a one size fits all strategy of 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy, several different studies have explored strategies that have used either longer durations of dual antiplatelet therapy involving an extended duration in particular of the adenosine diphosphate receptor inhibitor? Or are there certain groups or certain settings in which actually a shorter duration of the either the dual antiplatelet therapy in general or the P2Y12 inhibitor receptor in particular could advantage the patient in terms of a so-called net clinical benefit balancing both ischemic and bleeding risks? So at the ESC 2021, there were two major studies that looked at this problem. The first that I'll highlight is a study known as the Master DAP study. So this was a study that was a randomized clinical trial uh, comparing a standard antiplatelet regimen, namely involving 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy after PCI, uh, and compared it with an abbreviated strategy of dual antiplatelet therapy. And I'll detail a little bit about how that was structured. Now, notably, uh, the population that this study was looking at was not just all comers per se, but it was specifically looking at those individuals that we might consider to be most likely to benefit from a shorter duration of dual antiplatelet therapy, namely those who were deemed to have a high bleeding risk. And I'll say in a moment what I mean by that bleeding risk profile and how they assessed it. Uh, this study was uh, also uh, very specific in the nature of the PCI that was performed. Specifically, it was using a stent known as the Ultimaster stent that involved a biodegradable polymer. 
so this differs from many of the stents that we'll use most often in our practice, uh, which have a durable polymer, such as one that you may be familiar with called the Zion stent. Uh, the individuals who were included in this study, importantly, beyond being a, a high bleeding risk, were those who didn't have any overt ischemic complications of their initial PCI. So taking a, a closer look at the randomization. So the designers of the study recognized that some of the individuals at high bleeding risk in particular were at high risk because of the concomitant requirement for an oral anticoagulant medicine. And so recognizing this, they had particular protocols for those who were on oral anticoagulants versus those who were not. But as you can see in general, the abbreviated DAP strategy involved shortening uh, the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy, either to include just a single antiplatelet therapy after a first month of treatment, um, or uh, in those who are on concomitant oral anticoagulation therapy, limiting it to either to single antiplatelet therapy for uh, a total of uh, five additional months or stopping antiplatelets altogether and just continuing the oral anticoagulant. So who is at high bleeding risk? This is um, a graphical depiction of the factors that uh, led investigators to assess a patient to be at high bleeding risk. Uh, age was a major driver uh, of risk profile, uh, but other factors included high scores on uh, bleeding risk scores, the need for oral anticoagulants, uh, or some of the other less frequent uh, indications that are listed here. One of the important aspects of this master DAPT study is that it wasn't narrowly tailored toward just a stable ischemic heart disease population but rather it included patients across the spectrum of coronary artery disease, inclusive of those with silent ischemia, but also those presenting with acute coronary syndromes, either without or with ST segment elevations. So in capturing such a broad array of coronary patients, it made this a very generalizable study. Uh, and this was, uh, a look at the ischemic outcomes in the two groups, those with the abbreviated versus the standard duration of DAPT. Uh, and notably, you saw a complete overlap of the Kaplan-Meier curves in these individuals uh, with no evidence separation in the incidence of major adverse cardiac or cerebrovascular events with the shorter versus the standard duration of DAPT. Now looking in isolation at the bleeding uh, outcomes that occurred in the two groups, as might be expected, those with a more abbreviated strategy of dual antiplatelet therapy did indeed have a reduced incidence of bleeding events. Now I'll note that the bleeding events that were captured in the study included both major bleeding events and also what they colloquially referred to as clinically relevant non-major bleeding events. Um, this aggregated those two types. I, I'll let you know that it was really the clinically relevant non-major bleeding events that were the drivers of this difference. Um, for your reference, I'll put up some of the details here, but in effect, what I'll summarize is that there was non-inferiority of the abbreviated strategy uh, with respect to the composite of net adverse uh, uh, clinical events as well as ischemic events, but there was clear superiority in terms of a reduction in bleeding events with the abbreviated DAP strategy. So just to summarize, so in this study of patients who are at high bleeding risk undergoing PCI for conditions across the ischemic heart disease spectrum who didn't have any obvious ischemic complications of their initial PCI, the strategy of abbreviated DAP was non-inferior to standard DAP with respect to either net adverse events or major adverse cardiac and cerebrovascular events, but superior with respect to bleeding. Uh, importantly, these results were conserved whether or not the patients were on oral anticoagulants. And I would again just note that this study was only confined to those patients who A, had no obvious ischemic complications of their event, and B, had a very specific stent that was used that had a biodegradable polymer. So whether or not we could definitely extrapolate these results to those patients who were receiving durable polymer stents 
such as many of the cases that we'll do here in our laboratory uh, is uncertain. Now at the very same meeting as Master DAP, there was another study also looking at reduced duration of dual antiplatelet therapy. And this was the STOP DAPT2 ACS study that at the time of this presentation is not yet out for publication. Uh, so the data I'm sharing is that which was presented at the meeting. So this was an extension of a preceding study known as the STOP DAPT2 study, uh, which was looking at cardiovascular and bleeding events as a composite in patients who had received one month of dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, who were then either randomized to continuation of a standard protocol of dual antiplatelet therapy out to 12 months, or to monotherapy with clopidogrel. Now, the patients enrolled in this study were mostly those with a uh, stable ischemic heart disease, who accounted for 62% of the study population, uh, whereas 38% of the patients had acute coronary syndromes. So the STOPDAP2 ACS study said, well, we're worried about this subset of patients who has acute coronary syndromes because they may be at a higher ischemic risk profile. And so we're going to create a study cohort that aggregates those who were enrolled in STOPDAP2, that 38%, plus an additional 2,988 patients with ACS who were then randomized, again, to this strategy of standard 12 months of DAP versus one month of DAP followed by clopidogrel monotherapy. Uh, this was a multi-center study, uh, and they looked at a primary outcome measure of a composite of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, definite stent thrombosis, stroke, which could have been ischemic or hemorrhagic, or bleeding, for which they used the TIMI uh, scale, looking at both a composite of major and minor bleeding. And they followed patients out to one year. Uh, they also looked at these components of the composite primary outcome measure as primary uh, pre-specified secondary outcome measures. So the primary outcome, which again was an aggregate uh, of these ischemic and bleeding events, uh, occurred uh, in 65 patients assigned to one month DAPT and 58 patients assigned to 12 month DAPT. Uh, and the hazard ratio crossed unity, but it didn't meet the pre-specified criteria for non-inferiority uh, for the primary outcome measure. Breaking down the major secondary cardiovascular and bleeding outcome measures, um, again, uh, there seemed to be some tendency toward uh, increased risk of major cardiovascular outcomes in those with the shortened DAP strategy, uh, although it uh, crossed unity. Uh, and bleeding, as might have been expected, was less frequent with those with one month of DAPT. So to summarize the stop DAPT 2 ACS conclusions, for acute coronary syndrome patients, the strategy of one month DAPT and then subsequent clopidogrel monotherapy failed to achieve non-inferiority with respect to the net clinical events uh, benefit when compared with a standard of 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy. And the main reason for this is that the expected reduction in bleeding was offset by um, a sizable increase in major adverse cardiac and cerebrovascular events. And although the study was empowered to look at these individual secondary outcome measures in aggregate, uh, it failed to confirm the non-inferiority of that strategy. Now, one question that was raised in analysis of this study is that in use of clopidogrel, it's possible that they chose a drug that was destined for failure as a monotherapy agent. Uh, and in particular, as we'll go through it a little bit later on, it's possible that with the more potent agents, ticagrelor, which has now been looked at as a monotherapy agent, they might have seen better outcomes with that as a sole drug with respect to the ischemic outcomes. And it's conceivable that they could have uh, one on net adverse events uh, with the more potent anti-ischemic agent. So how can we reconcile these two studies which seem to have disparate results? So the one thing that's obvious from the two studies and shared by them is that if you use less DAP, you'll have less bleeding. And that's something that's certainly consistent with previous studies that have looked at strategies to reduce the intensity of antiplatelet therapy that a patient receives. But I think that the lesson from this is that the actual clinical importance of the associated bleeding reduction for a net clinical benefit is intensely related to the ischemic profile of the patient that you're testing this with. And so if you have somebody who's at a high ischemic risk, 
So certainly somebody with an acute coronary syndrome, and I might add that those patients who were excluded by design from the study, those who had ischemic complications of their initial PCI, it's entirely unclear that shortening or reducing your dual antiplatelet intensity is gonna benefit this patient in net, and it may very well expose them to an excessive risk of subsequent ischemic complications. Uh, but in light of studies such as Global Leaders and the Twilight Study, the latter of which was run by our very own Dr. Roxana Moran, um, it's very possible that ticagrelor as opposed to clopidogrel monotherapy could yet be a winning combination uh, that could both afford benefits for reduction in bleeding by cessation of aspirin uh, while preserving some of the anti-ischemic benefits that you're hoping for in the year that follows an ACS and PCI. Uh, so I think net-net for those in this group who take care of patients with acute myocardial infarctions, the standard of care at this point remains 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, pending further data looking explicitly uh, at ticagrelor monotherapy. So I'll shift gears. So a lot of our patients with myocardial infarction, but also patients even with other high-risk cardiovascular conditions, we worry that they're gonna be having arrhythmias when we're not looking at them. We're very, really uh, overprivileged in a sense in our ICUs that our patients are all hooked up to cardiac monitoring. So we get to see all the little arrhythmias that they may have. But there's a moment of trepidation at that moment somebody leaves our hospital where we worry, my gosh, the patient who is at high risk that I saw in the hospital is gonna be going home. They're leaving the nest. Are they gonna have VT or atrial fibrillation or complete heart block the moment that they leave the hospital while I'm not looking? And thanks to advances in technology, we do have ability to monitor these patients in a much more sensitive manner than simply the, the post-hospital follow-up appointment alone. And so the question is, can we afford benefit to patients with a sensitive means of monitoring for arrhythmias when they're beyond hospitalization and monitoring? So two studies addressed this from slightly different perspectives that were published and presented at the ESC. Uh, the first that I'll discuss was known as the SMART-MI study. So this was a prospective randomized open-label trial that enrolled survivors of acute myocardial infarction with mid-range reduction in uh, left ventricular ejection fraction uh, and who were felt to have cardiac autonomic dysfunction uh, as was identified in this study by a core laboratory using machine learning and digital biomarkers, uh, uh, analyzing 20 minute high resolution resting electrocardiograms. They were able to enroll 400 patients and randomize them in a one-to-one -one fashion to either receive an implantable cardiac monitor uh, with a rigorous protocol of remote monitoring versus a more conventional follow-up with office appointments and electrocardiograms as indicated. And they looked at a primary endpoint of the detection of a serious arrhythmic event. Uh, and within that group, they included atrial fibrillation lasting more than six minutes, high-grade atrial ventricular block, fast non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, or of course, sustained ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. And as perhaps might be expected, when you go looking with a high magnification uh, magnifying glass, you're gonna see a lot of arrhythmias. Uh, with the implantable cardiac monitor, uh, there were many fold, in fact, five fold higher detection of events that fit this primary outcome measure, 30% versus 6%, uh, which was highly statistically significant at a median of 21 months of follow-up. Now, when you looked at the importance of these arrhythmic events as predictors of major adverse cardiac and cerebrovascular events, Indeed, arrhythmias were significant predictors of these major clinical events, actually with a hazard ratio of approximately seven if you had an arrhythmia. But the study was really too small and not designed to test the association of the implanted monitors as a strategy with the clinical events. And so in analyzing the study, this investigators really needed to stop short of saying that you should routinely implant these monitors in these particular MI patients as a tool to prevent events, but it does highlight that you're gonna see a lot if you go looking for it. Um, at the same meeting, a second study was presented uh, of widespread relevance, which was the LOOP study. Uh, this again was a prospective randomized open label study uh, that enrolled individuals who were age 70 years or older 
who had at least one risk factor for stroke in the context of atrial fibrillation. Um, and we all know our CHAD score, so they included hypertension, diabetes mellitus, congestive heart failure, or a prior history of stroke uh, as eligible risk factors for inclusion. This was a large study. They were able to enroll over 6,000 patients, and they randomized them in a, in a one to three scheme to either receive an implantable cardiac monitor with remote monitoring or a more standard protocol of care and monitoring. So to be clear, these were patients who did not have known atrial fibrillation, but those who were people that we would be worried to be at risk for strokes or systemic emboli if they were to have atrial fibrillation. And the notion was that if we could detect more of these patients with atrial fibrillation, perhaps this would influence the likelihood that we would allocate anticoagulation and that we would be able to reduce strokes and systemic emboli. So in parallel with the SMART-MI study, with the implantable cardiac monitor, there was a significantly greater detection of the arrhythmia of interest, in this case, atrial fibrillation, uh, more than twofold higher rate, in fact, more than threefold higher likelihood uh, of detecting atrial fibrillation. Uh, and in parallel, as might be expected, there was much more initiation of anticoagulation uh, with the implantable cardiac monitor group as opposed to standard care. However, in the study that actually was powered to look at a primary clinical endpoint, there was not a detection of a statistically significant difference in the clinical outcome measured interest, namely stroke or systemic embolism. So how can we reconcile these two studies? I think both of them really highlight how much more sensitive implantable cardiac monitors are for picking up these arrhythmias. Uh, that are likely important to know about. And in fact, in SMART-MI, as was shown, there's a substantially increased risk of clinically important events in those patients who do have arrhythmias. However, I think looking at both of these studies, we still lack the evidence to endorse a widespread strategy of implanting implantable cardiac monitors in all these patients. And I think that's important because taken the wrong way, you could look at these studies and say, well, should we be putting monitors into a hugely increased population of patients that we see both in the hospital and outside the hospital. And I think in fair analysis of these studies, you really can't justify such a widespread uh, increase in utilization of implantable cardiac monitors at this point. Um, I do think, however, that both studies are really a wake-up call that there's a lot of arrhythmia that we're not seeing, uh, and we need to respect that uh, in thinking about the risk profiles of our patients. A third theme I'll highlight from ESC uh, was the treatment and prevention of viral illnesses, and in particular viral respiratory illnesses. I've included little cartoons of influenza and coronavirus here. So uh, a major randomized study concerning coronavirus was the ECLA PHRI cold COVID study. So this was another addition in the series of studies exploring colchicine as a potential therapeutic option for a coronavirus. Uh, this was a prospective randomized trial. Uh, it enrolled patients who were age 18 or older who were hospitalized with COVID-19 and severe acute respiratory syndrome uh, that was defined by the presence of dyspnea and imaging showing typical or atypical pneumonia uh, or hypoxemia. Uh, and since this was a study of colchicine, they excluded anybody who had chronic kidney disease who was pregnant or who had other uh, known contraindications to use of colchicine. They enrolled uh, 1,279 patients uh, who were then randomized in a one-to-one -one manner to either colchicine or placebo. And they looked at a primary endpoint of death or mechanical ventilation. Now, uh, to the chagrin of investigators, there was no significant difference in the primary outcome uh, between colchicine and the control group. Uh, nor was there any difference in the secondary outcome measure of death. Uh, what there was a difference in was diarrhea. You had more than twofold increase in diarrhea with colchicine. Uh, there was an exploratory secondary outcome measure looking at either new intubation or death from respiratory failure uh, that appeared to be slightly lower in the colchicine group. Uh, but again, this was uh, really hypothesis generating only. And so in summary from this study, there really was no strong evidence for benefit um, 
with use of colchicine as a treatment for hospitalized patients uh, with SARS uh, complicating COVID-19. Uh, but there was a definitive increase in the side effect of diarrhea, including severe diarrhea with colchicine. This was fairly consistent with now a broad array of trials looking at colchicine in general. Um, certainly this is an anti-inflammatory agent, uh, pretty much across the board when it has been looked at in studies, whether you're looking at atrial fibrillation after cardiac surgery uh, or other indications, you're gonna get more side effects with colchicine. And in view of that certainty of side effects, which include diarrhea in most and in poorly selected patients worsening renal function, you better be able to sell a good benefit uh, for the outcome measure of interest. And that simply wasn't present here uh, in cold COVID. Um, this comes on the heels of the premature cessation of the cold corona study, which was another randomized trial looking at colchicine for COVID-19, uh, which needed to be stopped early as well. And so at this point, there really uh, is lack of evidence to endorse colchicine as a treatment for these patients with respiratory insufficiency complicating COVID-19. Turning attention toward the preventive mode, a big win that was published at ESC uh, was the IAMI study. So this was a very cool randomized controlled study uh, of influenza vaccination uh, during the index hospitalization shortly following uh, treatment for acute myocardial infarction. So this was an investigator-initiated randomized double-blind trial, and they compared an inactivated influenza vaccine versus a saline placebo within 72 hours of patients who were, for the most part, hospitalized for an acute myocardial infarction. A uh, very small minority of patients were uh, there for a high-risk, stable uh, coronary heart disease syndrome. Uh, and the investigators were not looking at the likelihood of influenza. They were looking at the likelihood of death MI stent thrombosis uh, at 12 months. And now of interest, the study had been begun before the coronavirus pandemic, and they actually had to stop it short because of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic due to limitations for randomized research. Uh, but during the time period that they had, they were able to randomize over 2,500 patients. Uh, but this fall, fell far short of their power calculations. And yet, in spite of that truncated enrollment, they demonstrated a pretty impressive reduction in the cumulative inc incidence of their primary cardiovascular outcome measure with influenza vaccination. Um, looking more deeply, there was a reduction in all-cause death with vaccination. There was a reduction in cardiovascular death with influenza vaccination. And it was just a really tremendously impressive reduction in these cardiovascular events with influenza vaccination within 72 hours of the index PCI or hospitalization for acute myocardial infarction. And I think what's most notable about this is that the benefit was large and statistically significant in spite of number one, premature termination of enrollment and number two, that there was a fairly substantial crossover from the placebo group to the vaccination group. So these two major factors that would expect to bias toward the null hypothesis, in spite of this, there was quite an important reduction in the cardiovascular event rate uh, with influenza vaccination. So why, why might this be? Postulated mechanisms from the study, number one included that there may be some anti-inflammatory effect uh, and as we're learning more and more, the inflammation that follows an acute myocardial infarction is a critical mediator of not only subsequent events, but the actual pathologic progression of atherosclerosis after an index acute myocardial infarction. Uh, and then secondly, that by reducing the likelihood of an influenza infection, which is known to be itself a trigger of cardiovascular events, there would be a secondary reduction in adverse cardiovascular events. Um, so suffice it to say, the results were strongly supportive of making sure that our acute myocardial infarction patients are vaccinated against influenza. Uh, and in particular, uh, as we get into influenza season, uh, those of us caring for patients who are hospitalized for acute myocardial infarction, I would argue that it's really incumbent upon us that our patients are vaccinated before they leave the hospital. So as a final study that I'd like to highlight uh, during this hour, the question is raised, for our patients 
who have an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And of course, these make it into our cardiac ICU, but certainly also our medical intensive care units as well. For these patients who survive out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and show up, but don't have ST segment elevations, is there urgency to rush these patients to the cardiac catheterization lab? Or do we have some opportunity to care for these patients, sort things out, and then make a decision to bring them later? So the study that was presented at ESC and concurrently published in the New England Journal of Medicine was the Tomahawk study. So the premise for this is that if you look at our patients who have an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest with a presumed cardiac cause, up to 60% of these patients have their events that are explained by uh, precipitating acute coronary syndrome. And if you look at the electrocardiogram the patients come in with, the presence of ST segment elevations are certainly a very strong positive predictor of a causative acute coronary lesion, and in particular, a thrombotic acute coronary lesion explaining the event. But for the much larger group of patients who don't have ST segment elevations, this is a much broader array of underlying pathologies and pathophysiologies. And the benefit as a strategy of routinely bringing these patients to an invasive cardiac procedure is much less certain. Uh, and in fact, it's been called to question in a preceding randomized study that I'll mention in a moment. Uh, so that study was the COAC study, uh, which was a smaller study than Tomahawk that again was looking at patients with cardiac arrests and absence of ST segment elevation and looking at survival uh, in the short term uh, with a strategy of either immediate coronary angiography or delayed coronary angiography. And this was a really important study in so much as it showed that there was no evident penalty for death uh, by not bringing these patients immediately to the cardiac catheterization lab. Now, another lesson from this study, which I won't present today, was that it's not that you should never take these patients to the catheterization lab. And in fact, if and when you do go to coronary angiography in these patients, you find an awful lot of obstructive coronary artery disease that often leads clinically to revascularization procedures. But this study required some additional corroboration uh, and that led to the Tomahawk study. And there was a lot of nail biting, I'll say, on the part of interventional cardiologists worried that, you know, would circumstances change in so much as that we would have much more of a mandate to go to the catheterization lab early in these patients. So as I mentioned, Tomahawk was a randomized study. Uh, it took survivors of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest who did not have ST segment elevations. Uh, and these patients were randomized either to go immediately to the cardiac catheterization lab, in fact, directly transported to the catheterization lab, or rather to go initially to an intensive care unit setting where they would be stabilized, evaluated, managed, and then as clinically appropriate, subsequently referred to the cardiac cath lab for angiography. And the investigators looked at a primary outcome measure of 30-day mortality, uh, but then with also subsequent follow-ups at six and 12 months by telephone. Um, ultimately, they were able to enroll 50, uh, 554 patients, uh, of whom 530 ultimately were included in the analysis, and the randomization was one-to-one. -one. They looked at a primary outcome measure of all-cause death at 30 days, and then a, a secondary outcome measure of death or severe neurologic deficit of 30 days. And really, in striking similarity to COACT, there was no evident penalty uh, for the primary outcome measure uh, of survival at 30 days with a delayed strategy as opposed to immediate angiography. Uh, in fact, there was a numerical uh, excess of death with the immediate angiography as opposed to the delayed strategy. Um, I won't get into the details here, uh, but just to show you that there really was no evident benefit to the immediate angiography strategy looking either at the primary outcome measure um, or at uh, secondary efficacy endpoints. In terms of safety endpoints, again, uh, there was uh, no significant difference detected and certainly no penalty with the delayed strategy.
Can everybody hear me? Sorry, my internet had a transient ischemia. Yes, we can hear you. Um, there was no subgroup uh, that seemed to have a peculiar benefit of the immediate strategy as opposed to a delayed strategy. So in summary, looking at Tomahawk, I would say that there was really no evident benefit for either survival or neurologically favorable survival with rushing the patients immediately to the catheterization lab when their cardiac arrest was associated with no ST segment elevations. Now, it's critical to note that at the size of the study and with the design of the study, it really wasn't designed to look at other potential beneficial cardiac effects of taking these patients early to the cath lab in terms of left ventricular ejection fraction or infarct size on an MRI by LV mass or anything like that. So it wasn't that type of a study. But in terms of looking at death, there was no difference between the two. I think in large part, this likely speaks to the fact that the actual cardiovascular death ends up making up a small percentage of the actual ultimate death in these patients. Certainly there will be some who will die from circulatory failure and cardiogenic shock, as might be complicating myocardial infarction. But brain death ends up being a major, major driver of mortality in these patients. And ultimately, whether or not you open that 72% lesion in the distal RCA is not gonna make a difference in that eventuality. So integrating Tomahawk and COACT, I think here you see two well-designed randomized studies looking at this question in a high quality way, and that they show no apparent benefit to immediately taking these patients with absence of ST elevation to the cath lab right away. Uh, but again, taking lessons from COACT and looking at angiographic findings in that study, I think that we need to remind ourselves that in these non-ST elevation patients that we should not neglect to pay attention to the very high prevalence of coronary artery disease in these patients. And should the patients survive with a favorable early neurologic outcome, we likely should be making sure to assess the coronary anatomy in these patients. Now, a great, to, a great deal remains to be unpacked about whether or not there's benefit to revascularization should we find coronary artery disease. And none of these studies has convincingly demonstrated this in this context of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And that really is one of the next frontiers in unpacking what to do with coronary artery disease that we find in the absence of ST elevations. This is of course a much broader area of discussion beyond cardiac arrest, looking at all these patients we take care of with type two myocardial infarctions who are found to have coronary artery disease. And one of the big themes that I think you're gonna see over the next three to five years is how we deal with the coronary artery disease we find in our patients who perhaps leak troponin but don't show ST elevations in the context of hospitalization for acute illnesses. Now, I want to underscore that the patients studied in both of these studies are not patients with ST elevation MI. Uh, and in fact, you could make the argument that it would be unethical to randomize patients with ST elevation MI to a strategy of an immediate or non-immediate care. And so I don't foresee there being a randomized study to look at this. And I wanna emphasize that nobody should take away from these studies that a patient with ST elevations after cardiac arrest should not be afforded immediate angiography. These are patients with STEMI and the class one indication, whether or not you're having an arrest is to take these patients to the cath lab. Now, I think it's important as critical care physicians, as advocates for these patients, uh, that there are times that we need to remind our interventional colleagues uh, of whom I'm one, that no, this patient does need to go to the cath lab right now. They have ST segment elevations after they're out of hospital cardiac arrest. And although we don't yet know the neurologic outcome, our guidelines and our evidence strongly support an immediate strategy of angiography. So if anybody like me ever says, well, I'm not sure if we should go, they just had a cardiac arrest, you should put me in my place and say, this is a STEMI, you need to take this patient to the cath lab. So we've taken a whirlwind tour through seven studies of interest. Um, I would highlight the following key points. So number one, that abbreviation of dual antiplatelet therapy after PCI reduces bleeding, but the benefit of this bleeding reduction needs to be balanced against an individual patient's ischemic risk profile when you're assessing the net benefit of such an approach. And the patients we care for who are at high risk for ischemic events, whether you're talking about 
thrombotic lesions in STEMI or those who have early ischemic events after their PCIs, these are not the patients to cut short the DAPT. And certainly if you're thinking about a P2Y12 inhibitor monotherapy, there really isn't signal towards safety with clopidogrel monotherapy at this point. If you want to dally in that sort of game, at a minimum use ticagrelor, uh, looking at evidence from twilight and global leaders. Um, secondly, there are a lot of arrhythmias that we don't see. And thinking about the various patients we care for who are at high risk for these arrhythmias in the studies from ESC, looking at those who are perhaps at high risk for atrial fibrillation and complications thereof, or those patients with MI who suffer insults to their ejection fraction. And I might broaden this talking about the patients that we care for, for example, in the CICU, who are high risk patients undergoing structural heart disease interventions. There's a lot of arrhythmia that's gonna be happening after you leave the hospital. And we need to be attuned to that and think about strategies for detecting these events. Now, whether that means implanting cardiac monitors in all these patients, which would be a major change to care, and I would say a major resource expense, uh, it really remains to be proven by high quality evidence. And so I think we need to put the brakes on putting loops into every single patient we meet. Uh, but I do think that as clinicians, we need to be attuned to the fact that we're missing a lot of arrhythmias if we just use standard monitoring protocols. Um, third, and this is for all the colchicine enthusiasts out there, unfortunately, it can't be endorsed as a treatment strategy uh, for reducing death and respiratory failure in COVID-19. Uh, but there are many ongoing studies looking at colchicine for varied indications. And so there's, uh, you know, you don't need to sell your stock in colchicine just yet. Um, influenza vaccination is a good thing, uh, and we now can confirm, in particular in those who are experiencing acute myocardial infarctions, that this is a group that's at quite high risk for subsequent cardiovascular events, and modulating uh, the influenza dimension of their lives, uh, whether via anti-inflammatory effects of vaccination or via reduction in influenza events, it also translates into reductions in cardiovascular events. And so we should consider our MI patients as a high-risk population, and we should afford them the benefit of vaccination as soon as possible, uh, and likely within their index hospitalization, particularly within flu season. And then finally, to the point of how we should navigate allocation of angiography in our out-of-hospital cardiac arrest patients without ST elevations, I think that the take-home messages don't neglect defining the coronary anatomy and those who are recovering from the immediate phases of their cardiac arrest, but don't feel compelled to rush these patients to the cath lab. And again, these are not ST elevation MI patients. Those patients require immediate angiography. So that was my summary of seven key trials from ESC that I think that this group might be interested to learn. Uh, I wanna conserve the remainder of the time for discussion. We have a lot of thoughtful people in this audience, and uh, I'd love to field questions and engage in some friendly discussion and debate. Thank you for a carefully curated review of germane topics discussed in this year's European Society of Cardiology, Matt. That is fantastic. I was really uh, excited. I really am excited now for the role of SGLT2s. First, uh, almost surprisingly, when it showed mortality benefit in people with HEFREF. And now with Emperor Preserved and also um, CKD. So here we have a whole new class of drugs that regardless of glucose control are, has, has new indications and is approved by the FDA for such indications. Rarely do we come across such a serendipitous finding. What, what is your um, takeaway from the combined trials and how do you see SGLT2s positioned? Where, 
now we have to include it in GDMP and how do we uh, stage these various drugs and how quickly do we escalate them? How do we manage GDMT given the addition of a brand new class of drugs just a few years after another new class of drugs, the Arnies? So um, th thank you for the comment and question. Um, so uh, first, again, I guess to emphasize I think it's such an important study that it likely, frankly, benefits uh, a much more detailed unpacking of the design of the study, uh, which will exceed this, the scope of my answer at this point. Um, I think it was clearly uh, uh, an explosive study uh, that asked a lot of questions. And I would only put forward the following thoughts and comments. First is that some dose of skepticism, I think, is needed when you look at decades of you know, well thought out studies of agents for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction that were not successful, and then you have one agent that is successful. And it's, it's conceivable that there is something singular about this drug class and mechanism that in fact affords benefit to this group of patients. But, but I think it also obligates some caution um, my perception of the momentum of cardiology is that reactions to the study are to embrace this. And I think that we will start to see changes in guidelines based upon this. Um, but I do think some caution is needed. And some lessons perhaps can be taken looking at, if you will, the paradigm of Entresto, uh, in so much as that, again, you had a large, well-designed, randomized study that demonstrated a statistically significant and clinically relevant benefit with a novel therapy as opposed to a standard therapy. Uh, to the extent that this changed guidelines and changed emphasis in our practices, and yet in the implementation of moving from the old to the new, number one, we encountered a number of new side effects, uh, perhaps post-marketing, uh, that required some individualization of how we prescribe and allocate therapies that maybe get whitewashed by some of the analysis of the ideally situated clinical trial population. Number two, uh, in the delivery of new drugs uh, that are very often branded with different expense considerations, there become very real barriers to not only the allocation of these therapies, but I might say the equitable allocation of these therapies across different groups of patients that we care for uh, who have heart failure uh, with certain haves and have nots. And third, related to that delivery, uh, hospital pharmacy and therapeutics committees uh, and purchasing programs within hospitals may take some time to catch up with evidence that's presented at meetings and published in journals uh, before it is readily simple to deliver certain therapies. And so I, I think that there will be likely barriers for some time to our ability to readily make these available to patients. Uh, these will be felt within the hospital stay, but frankly also after discharge. And I think that if we ultimately do believe based upon not just the initially presented evidence, but the ultimate exegesis of that evidence by learned people, that this in fact is something that we should be starting all of these patients on, that we better focus also on the implementation side to make this affordable and feasible with protocols that make sense for monitoring delivery in the hospital. Do you feel otherwise, Dr. Kidwani? No, I completely agree with you. I think this opens up the issue of the second degree problem, which has been well demonstrated, and that is the adherence. The more complicated the paradigm, the more difficult it is to get patients to adhere. Uh, and sometimes I feel that we have enough medications. Now, if we were able to have what Atul Gawande calls follow-through innovation, he talks about contrasting breakthrough innovation, which we are good at, with follow-through innovation, which is how to maintain this kind of uh, 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 excitement uh, and compliance and adherence, we would be better off. If we can shunt some of the money from developing new drugs to making sure that patients 
have a way of taking these drugs that are already available, we may even have better outcomes. But that's a question of uh, social justice and other implementation and other kind of innovative things. But we see here ongoing breakthrough innovation. Who has questions? There, there should be hundreds of questions, I suspect, after this wonderful overview of uh, you know broad range of topics. You can type in the chat box if you wish, and I will convey your question or just unmute yourself and ask the question. All right, then if there are no questions, it's almost one o'clock. And once again, I thank you, Matt, uh, for being uh, an invaluable member of the faculty and for a wonderful talk here today. Thank you for having me. Thank you.